So how dangerous are China's aircraft carrier killer missiles? And like, how are they different from what there was, you know, during the Korean War, during other wars? Well, in the Korean War, they didn't have these missiles. They would have, you know, patrol boats or they'd have a, you know, some aircraft come out and drop a single small bomb. I mean, these ballistic missiles are designed to find big metal at sea, big aircraft carriers, a thousand foot long piece of flight deck, and to find it, either tracking its radar before it launches, and then after it launches, while it's up in space and comes down in the atmosphere, it can reacquire if it's moved, and then zero in on it, going at, you know, five times the speed of sound, maneuvering, and then hit the target. Now, people say, well, they've never done it in real life. They said that for many, many years. But then in August of 2020, we saw the Chinese shoot a salvo of anti-ship ballistic missiles uh, into the South China Sea closure area. And from all the reports that I've read, it said that they were they were at a maneuvering, moving target in that closure area. Uh, I, could, I, I can't go into other details, but I'm confident that the Chinese anti-carrier ballistic missile force of the DF-21D and the DF-26 when shot in large numbers, not just one at a time, but when you shoot a hundred of them, it dramatically increases your capability and probability of hitting an aircraft carrier. And when it hits one, it's something that we haven't had since World War II. And we're not, we're not prepared for that. We have, we have damage control on our ships and we have things of that nature. But psychologically, we're not prepared for the first time a U.S. aircraft carrier takes a, takes a ballistic missile and it blows up on an aircraft carrier. So how can the U.S. Navy defend against this or prepare to defend against it? Well, we have been preparing this. I don't want to, again, get over my skis here. Uh, there's been work going on since before I retired that figures out how to defeat that missile by deceiving it. And I'll just leave it at that. And so there's, 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 there's technologies and there's work that's going on. They call it left of kill chain. So before the missile is fired, can you can you tell? Can you deceive them on where you're at? So all kinds of things are been put into place to try to defeat the missile. Uh, and there's ballistic missile defense systems like the FAD, Theater High Area Air Defense System, or the Patriot. Uh, but again, Patriots and FADs are not of any use in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, right? There's not going to be a FAD battery steaming alongside an aircraft carrier, at least not yet. So this. It's a very difficult problem, and it causes us to think in different ways than just using aircraft carriers, which is what our pr predominant, not exclusive, but one of our biggest threat vectors to the Chinese is the aircraft carrier. We have submarines, we have surface ships, we have other things that we need to start getting after. And there are people that have proposed this. I don't want to say that no one has done it. There's a, a lot of good proposals out there. During the Trump administration, there was a proposal for a 500-ship Navy where a, a large percentage of that was unmanned uh, surface vehicles and undersea vehicles that could, you know, be deployed out in kind of a, uh, in packs of, of ships that could, you know, be uh, driven by other sensors that could get it to the threat area, get it to the Chinese Navy and, you know, expend weapon systems. But again, it's not from a national perspective. It's not something that we hear our politicians talk about. It's not something we even hear the Defense Department really hammer every day. And so that's the, the real issue I have. And then, like I said, I don't think the academic community is clearly there at all. No one's talking about this aspect of it. It's like everybody in the PLA is equal. If you're a soldier with a rifle or you're on an aircraft carrier or you're in a submarine or you're a strategic rocket force person or in the Air Force, they're treated almost as if they're all the same, and they're not. The discussion on the PLA Navy has always struck me as being very strange. Like, transparently, the Chinese Communist Party has been designing uh, capabilities specifically targeted at destroying America's Navy. Like, that was, that, that was obvious to even us, like, years and years ago. Um, but yet, it was, like, we, it seemed like as a nation, we never really, like, took it seriously that like, hey, China is transparently trying to destroy, making a system to destroy our Navy. And there were, and there was never really any of a, a response to that, even as, you know, they ended up having the biggest Navy in the world. It just seemed like there was not ever anything that was talked about. 
no one seemed to want to prepare for it or treat China as a threat, even though clearly they were working at undermining the United States military. Right. I, I agree with that. I mean, it's and if you think about it, you have people inside the U.S. Navy, you have admirals, scores and scores of admirals and scores and scores of senior executive service, SESs, all people that are making quite handsome sums of, of, of salaries. And you'd think that somewhere along the line, at least the people inside the Navy would stand up and say, hey, uh, we got to do something a little bit different here because uh, we're going to get smoked by these guys if we don't get back to, you know, prioritizing resources and and, and strategies towards naval warfare. Uh, but that's never really happened. Instead, what happened over the last 30 years is you had, unfortunately, admirals and, and, and SESs that basically said, well, we have to follow whatever is the, the you know, and you, you want that. You don't want people to be rogue, but it's just been this, you know, kind of, well, we're in the war in the desert, we're in the war against terror. And so that's the most important thing that we need to focus on. And I'm not going to be the leader of the Navy at this time that's going to buck that system and try to do something different. The Air Force had a couple of people that did that and they got fired by Secretary of Defense Gates. He said, I don't want to hear anything that's not going to help me fight today's war when you come and tell me about something that's going to be in 20 years from now. I only want to hear about today's war. Well, that's not really the purpose of the leadership of the Pentagon. The purpose of the leadership of the Pentagon is to look down the road and say, what's coming? And let's make sure as a nation that we never get it put in a position where it, we're at a disadvantage. And so no matter what anybody wants to say, and they get very upset when I say this, the fact of the matter is we're sitting here in 2022 with a PLA Navy that's larger than the United States Navy. And not one Navy admiral, not, not one senior executive service person has been fired or held to account for how we got to this point. We just were the frog in the pot, and we've been boiling one degree at a time, increasing one degree at a time over 30 years. And now we're, now we're like, okay, we don't want to talk about it. Oh, I was going to ask, because you were talking about how China's developed a different type of Navy than us. Is part of this just kind of looking at China and measuring them against our Navy? Because when you say, you know, the China's Navy is bigger than ours now, I've seen a lot of people dismiss that as well. Like, they're small ships. You know, we still have the most aircraft carriers, et cetera. Right. Well, over the last decade, China's outproduced us in tonnage. So, I mean, they're, they're actually, if we project that out another 10 years, who's to say who's actually got more ships, not hulls of ships, but larger size ships? If you look at just last year in 2021, China commissioned 22 warships. They were big, big 10,000 to 15,000 ton uh, destroyers and cruisers. The United States commissioned three ships, two of which were small LCS class and one submarine, I think. So we're on a trajectory where they're growing bigger and better in every metric and we're not. And so, yes, we were an, a carrier Navy. And our carrier Navy's done great things. And I spent 20 years of my life on carriers. So I, I, I respect everything that we've done and continue to do today. But the fact of the matter is, if we were to try to defend Taiwan in the naval arena, we're going to have a hell of a time defending them because China has a Navy that can get in, drop off troops, and keep ours at bay. And that's today. Where will they be when they say they want to be the world's, you know, number one superpower in 2045, 2049? And what kind of Navy will it have then? And if they continue on this trajectory, they're going to have a Navy that's going to be essentially the U.S. Navy, where they're operating globally with aircraft carriers and expeditionary strike groups. And uh, we just don't seem to be uh, aware of that. And, and it's not driving us. And we don't see the linkage between what that means and what it what it the impact is on our life as as Americans we should see it now after 2 years of covid when you see 100 ships off the port of long beach you should understand the impact that maritime trade has on a nation and why it's so important to be able to have a strong navy we recognize that early on as a nation uh, our founding fathers were pretty smart about that they were forced into it by the british the British learned that throughout their history. So a strong Navy means a strong nation, and Xi has recognized that. 
I think Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping also recognize it, but Xi's the one that's really kind of, if you want to say, you know, wrapped it up in a, and put a bow in it and really elevated the PLA Navy and maritime issues.